Well, praise the Lord, folks. It is 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, and of course that means it is time for us to begin our midweek Bible study. We greet you as always this evening in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wasn't able to do my five-minute countdown today. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I'm i still kind of recovering from our trip to Kentucky. It was a good trip, so I have no complaints. Um, however, it was tiring. <laughs> it was a little tiring. And so I'm still recovering a little bit from our trip. And uh, I fell asleep this afternoon. And it, and I woke up just a little bit late. And uh, so I had to rush in here and get everything going. And then wouldn't you know that today the computer was going to decide it needed to do an update and uh, so I had to I had to get the uh, updates working and try to get them installed and everything and boy howdy let me tell you it went right to the last second I said boy I'm barely gonna be able to get started right on time today anyway we are so happy to have you join us today as we continue our study on ghosts, ghouls, and bumps in the night. Um, I have some, I, I think, some interesting and exciting stuff that I'm going to share with you as well concerning our trip to Kentucky. Uh, that'll help to illustrate some of what we've talked about in our Bible study. And uh, I'm excited to share some uh, good news about what transpired during the course of our uh, time in Kentucky. And uh, we'll be talking about that in just a minute. In the meantime, let's get started this afternoon or this evening, I should say, with a word of prayer. Father, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity once again to come and to investigate the things of God, the Word of God, the truths of God. We ask, Master, tonight that the anointing of the Holy Ghost might reside upon the teacher as well, upon, as, well as upon the ear of every hearer. Help me, Lord to deliver unto the people of God that which you would have me to deliver and help those that hear to be in a place to receive and to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Master, we need you so greatly in this last day. And Master, we just ask God that you would allow the truths of God to come alive in our spirit to affect change and improvement in us that is necessary for us to be an effective witness and a tool in the kingdom of God for your use, for the benefit of your people and the furtherance of your gospel. We ask all this today and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Um, we started last week, uh, I kind of wanted to bring the ghosts and haunting discussion to a close and at least finish up that part of this study. And so last week we began to look at um, things we know from Scripture, truths we know from Scripture, so that last week and this week, will kind of be a synopsis of the last many weeks that we have been studying. And that way, people uh, who may not have the time or the ability 
to watch the entire study can really get a, a crash course on what we've been talking about and looking at simply by watching last week and this week's uh, sessions. Now, we were talking about, last week we talked about the fact that the spirit world is real. We talked about the fact angels and demons are two categories of spiritual beings. Angels assist people. Demons deceive people. Both angels and demons, according to the Word of God, can physically manifest within the physical world. Demons require permission, uh, whether that be intended or not intended, to be able to access an individual or to affect their lives. Uh, there are a number of ways through which a demon may be able to access uh, or may be able to be given access to an individual. There are many ways that demons are given access. It can be everything from exposing yourself to someone who has a demonic oppression or possession and in so doing bringing vexation upon yourself or it can be you've had association with bad doctrine, bad teaching, uh, organizations and people who teach things which are in gross contradiction to the Word of God. You know, folks, let, let me tell you some things. There are some matters, and you're not going to hear a lot of preachers say this. I, t I tend to say things that a lot of preachers won't say. Um... I absolutely believe with all my heart they're true. Um, but uh, so many preachers are afraid to say it because um, they're afraid, you know, well, but people might react this way or people might react that way or people might take it this way or that way. You cannot control how people um, digest what you have to say. <laughs> But truth can be spoken nonetheless. What I want to say is this. There are issues which really are not of great importance that people debate and people argue with concerning the Word of God every day. And uh, there are some issues that are just really not that important, so it really doesn't matter. But then there are issues which are of extreme importance, and therefore they absolutely do matter. So how you believe and how you understand these certain scriptures absolutely do matter. You say, well, Pastor, give me an example of what you mean by that. Okay, let me give you an example. Some people will want to argue as to whether um, Jonah was thrown off the boat and swallowed by a big fish or a whale, literally. Because in the New Testament, the Lord uh, speaks of Jonah being the, in the belly of a whale. In the Old Testament passages in Jonah, speaks of God preparing a great fish for Jonah. And technically, of course, a whale is not a fish. A whale is a mammal. And um, so you actually have people that will stand there and argue, you know, well, uh, was it a great fish or was it a whale? Or is it at all possible that the Lord was simply um, saying that uh, the whale was a great fish? Or that in the Old Testament, the reference to a, a great fish is re referencing a whale, okay? That really doesn't matter a hill of beans. You can argue that point till the cows come home, and it really doesn't matter. One way or the other, there was a sea creature that the Word of God said God prepared that was of such a size uh, so as to be able to swallow Jonah. 
And uh, that's the basic point you need to get, okay? Whether you want to argue about whether it was a great fish or a whale really doesn't amount to a hill of beans. So there are things that people can believe which are inaccurate, which really doesn't matter a whole lot in the, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but then there are other things that are of tremendous importance that require that we absolutely uh, are on point. So just because you uh, associate with, or maybe you've been under a pastor who preached things that were not entirely accurate, doesn't mean that uh, you opened yourself up to some sort of a demonic oppression or vexation. Uh, but if they're teaching false doctrine that is absolutely unequivocally false as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is a different ball of wax. I remember years ago I was pastoring my second church, and while I was at the Riverside Church of God, I had heard a preacher uh, Brother Willie, I can't remember what his last name was, but his first name was Willie. Brother Willie was a good preacher. He he had a good message. He preached a real good message. and uh, But he was country. I mean, this man, bless his heart, he came right out of the backwoods of Kentucky or Tennessee or Oklahoma or something. And and he didn't have much of an education, you know. And anyway, I decided when I started my second church, which was just outside of Fort Worth a little bit, I decided that we wanted to have Brother Willie come preach for us. And he preached us a little revival. And so Brother Willie come to preach a revival for us. And... Um, of course, you know, each night I would introduce him and he'd come to the pulpit and preach. Well, one night of the revival, he got up and he was preaching, you know, and then he began to go into a diatribe about how the church had it all wrong and how that uh, uh, preachers preached it wrong concerning the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he said, you know, the angel told the disciples and the apostles that he would return in the same manner that they saw him go. And he began to go into, you know, how when the Lord returns, uh, every eye shall see him. And he began to quote certain scriptures and what have you. Well, uh, the next evening when it came time to introduce Brother Willie, I said, now, folks, I just have something to say. I want to clarify something. Um, we love Brother Willie, and I am not chastising him. I'm not rebuking him or anything. I said, but as the pastor of this church, it is my responsibility to make certain that everything that comes over this pulpit is biblically accurate and true. And I said, and Brother Willie made a small error yesterday in his preaching, and I want to clarify it before I have him come up tonight and preach. Then I began to explain. I said, Brother Willie uh, has confused the second coming, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, his physical return to earth with the rapture of the church. I said, this is not an uncommon mistake, but it is a mistake nonetheless. There are two events, not one. The rapture of the church will come first, and I believe three and a half years later, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ will take place. And I kind of explained for a minute, and then I said, okay. I said, now, I want you to understand if you believe this wrong, if you know, if you have a wrong understanding of this, you're not going to go to hell over it. You're not going to lose out with God. You're not going to fall from grace. Uh, but I just have to clarify because, as I say, as the pastor of this church, 
this pulpit is my responsibility. So anyway, Brother Willie got up to preach, and he stood there for a minute, and he was a little quiet, and he said, folks, he said, you have no idea how wonderful it is that you have a pastor who takes his responsibility serious enough to do what he's done tonight. He said, I feel so foolish, he said, listening to him. I could easily see that what he was saying was right and accurate. He said, I've been running around like some kind of a nut preaching what I preached last night for years. He said, and no one, not one pastor has ever um, taken me aside and corrected me or uh, helped me to understand this from a biblical perspective. He said, but your pastor takes his responsibility seriously. And he said, and I want you to know, I appreciate what he's done tonight because not only is he clarified for y'all, but he's clarified for me so that I don't look the fool and I'm preaching an accurate message. So I said all that to say, not every point, you know, not everything uh, that people preach uh, or everything that people believe. You know, I've talked to people one-on-one -on -one sometimes and some of the stuff they'll say kind of cracks me up, you know. Well, I believe blah, 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 you know, and I'm thinking to myself, well, good Lord, that, no, that's not scriptural, that's not accurate. But I'm not going to argue with them, and I'm not going to debate with them, and I'm not going to chastise them, rebuke them, correct them, whatever you want to call it. Uh, a lot of times I'll try to gently... Um, interject the truth. You know, I'll try to gently kind of uh, just speak of it in casual conversation. So hopefully they'll pick up on it and they'll uh, correct their course. Um, but I understand that not every single little tiny point, you know, uh, I'm going to say this, and, and I know fundamentalists and evangelicals are going to swallow their gums when I say this. But if someone comes to me, for instance, and they say, well, I don't necessarily believe that the story of Noah uh, is um, accurate and you know I'm not sure it's scientifically possible and blah 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 and you know so but I believe that uh, the Lord gave us that story to illustrate various truths and spiritual principles and what have you um, that is not a point to be honest that is worth arguing that is not, now I believe that every word of the Lord is true. I, I trust everything God said. I believe that when we get to glory, we're going to understand things about uh, things we've read in Scripture that we couldn't wrap our mind around. I believe one day we're going to understand it. The Bible said, for now we know in part, we see in part, but then one day we're going to be looking at the Lord face to face and we will have all knowledge and all understanding. And all of a sudden there's going to be knowledge that comes available to us. You know, scientists crack me up because they, they say things, they teach things, they uh, insist that certain things are absolute fact and certain things are absolutely true. And then years and years later, they discover something and they'll turn around and say, well, you know, we thought thus and so, but now we've come to realize that this really isn't factual because we've had additional knowledge come available to us, you know. So I do believe that there is a uh, an arrogance in the human race, when we assume, when we read the Word of God, when we assume that we know everything, and therefore we can sit in judgment of things we read in Scripture, 
And uh, because after all, we know more than God, you know. And I think that's a very dangerous route to take. But anyway, so I just want to make that clear, though. There's a difference between being part of a cult like the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Scientology, Christian Science, you name it. Um, which have doctrines which are in utter and complete contradiction to the truths of God. And if the doctrine affects, or if the thought or the belief affects um, the fundamentals of the gospel of Jesus Christ in any way, then those must be corrected because um, it is imperative that your understanding of the fundamentals of the gospel be accurate. I don't care if somebody doesn't understand or can't wrap their mind around the entire Old Testament. As long as you can understand the fundamentals of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you're able to believe the gospel and obey the gospel and know what you're doing and why you're doing it, then, folks, that's enough, okay? Um, so I just wanted to make that clear because one of the ways that demons can gain access to an individual is through false doctrine, false teaching, association with organ excuse me, organizations or people who uh, purport false doctrine, teach false doctrine and false teaching. But if it's just a matter of some little point, some little thing uh, that is not of any great significance, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? We continue with things we know from Scripture. Demons will generally seek out and afflict the most spiritually vulnerable. This can include children right down to infancy. And uh, this is important to understand. That's why when people claim their homes are haunted, you know, a lot of times, many if not most times, it begins with the children. Uh, the children have their, quote, imaginary friends that they begin to interact with, that they begin to speak with and what have you. And then it'll evolve from there. Um, but uh, also, of course, you see cases on some of these programs on television where the parents have a camera set up on the crib of their baby and there's some sort of entity or there's some sort of manifestation occurring regularly around that crib. The enemy wants to get hold of the mind, wants to affect the beliefs and the thoughts of an individual. If, if he can get you at your youngest, he can have you potentially for life. He also often will take those that he has deceived early in life by reason of so-called ghostly visitations and spiritual manifestation. A lot of times he'll take those early in life experiences and he's able to turn that individual, listen carefully, into an evangelist of false teaching. He can convince them of things which are entirely contradictory to the Word of God. And then these people turn around and they go out and they perpetuate, they uh, evangelize, as it were, with this false teaching and these false beliefs. And they begin to go out and tell people, you know, well, after death, you can get stuck here. After death, uh, you, some people just love their home so much that they stay at that home and they uh, don't want to leave. And how many times have you heard on these ghost programs, you know, uh, oh, well, the, I, I just saw one recently, for instance, where this old man uh, was a homesteader and he had built a little home on a property that he was given by the government. And then later a man went and uh, investigated this site and wound up being chased out by 
uh, spiritual presence that scared the life out of him. And he claims, of course, it was this old man. And he said, you know, this man didn't want anybody on his property and in his house. But the Word of God teaches that upon death, we become divorced from everything, everything associated with this life. We came into this world naked and we leave this world naked. We come in without possessions. We leave without possessions. That's why Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where dust and moth doth not corrupt and where thieves do not come in to steal. And we do that through good works and through godly conduct and through charitable action um, and compassion, uh, you know, action born of compassion. And uh, But as far as being able to carry anything into the next life, it is not possible. This is why we keep talking about it uh, in this study. This is why the notion of ghosts wearing uh, the outfit they were buried in, or wearing an outfit, a uniform uh, that they wore in military service, or a uniform they wore when they were working in a certain uh, security job or something. Um, no, you cannot take that outfit with you. And <laughs> so therefore, uh, how on earth can you accept in contradiction to Scripture that that spirit is indeed the person that they're representing themselves to be? Can't be, because your uniform doesn't pass into eternity. You don't bring your uniform with you. You also, nowhere in Scripture are we taught that we have, I keep saying over and over again, Harry Potter magic powers, that after death, all of a sudden, ooh, spirits have all these magic powers. Well, they can represent themselves any way they want to represent themselves. They can represent themselves as children. They can rep them, represent themselves as a man when really they're a woman. They can represent themselves as blah, blah, blah. and all these foolish imaginations of the heart uh, in reality, my friend, are attributes that the Word of God ascribes to demons. The Word of God tells us that demon spirits can in fact do all these things which these paranormal experts are telling us ghosts can do. Nowhere in Scripture does it tell us that after death, the dead have these abilities. But the Word of God does tell us that both angels and demons have the ability to do exactly what uh, they describe. So therefore, as Bible-believing Christians, we believe and understand that when we're dealing with someone as it were, who represents themselves as a person who has uh, left this life. We are in reality dealing with a demon who has masked itself in the identity of someone that can be um, verified as having some connection to the land, to the property, to the home, whatever the case might be. And they do that in order to give themselves uh, justification in the mind of the observer for their being there and to create a sense of acceptance. If the person, again, I've seen stories even recently where people had a so-called ghost, you know, um, uh, haunting their home and all this, and uh, they determine that, oh, it's the spirit of uh, the old lady who used to live here, or the woman who used to live here. Well, you know, I'm not interested in her leaving, you know. I don't see any need to ask her to leave. You know, we can live 
uh, we can coexist without any problem. Folks, that is dangerous. That is highly dangerous because you're giving that demon spirit permission. Now you are purposefully giving that spirit that you've been deceived into believing was this person. And you're giving that spirit permission to stay. And as I've stated over and over again, every spirit is somewhere on, uh, on a scale of authority and power. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We're dealing with levels of authority and power and lower level spirits. Their only job is to push that door that you've opened open wider and wider so that the next level spirit can come in. So while you turn around and you give this spirit, which may in fact be uh, something as simple as uh, a spirit of jealousy or a spirit of um, depression, for instance, you give that spirit permission to stay, and then that spirit is going to vex you and afflict you and oppress you until the door has been pushed wider open, and before too long, you're going to have a suicidal spirit come in. You're going to have an, a spirit of anger come in. Uh, you may have a spirit of murder come in. And I've seen literal, real-life circumstances where this has happened. Even within my own family, I saw it happen. And uh, you're, it is extremely dangerous. We do not do that. And also, we do not seek out to interact with anyone who tries to communicate with the dead or the spirit world at any level. You are playing with fire. Uh, I mean, you're, honey, you're playing with matches while you're standing next to a gasoline tank, okay? Um, that is extremely dangerous. I have tried to advise people in my own family when I see them talk about, uh, oh, I want to go see this psychic because I want to talk to my mother. I want to talk to this person or that person who's passed on. And I tried to gently warn them that this is dangerous. You, you, you don't know how many people wind up walking away from those experiences with an attachment. And uh, they wind up walking away and they've become oppressed They've become vexed by a demonic spirit, and that spirit will just continue to work on them. And as I've said over and over again, and their job is to do their job because each spirit does exactly one job. That's it. Every, this is the highest level of efficiency that you will ever achieve. If you look at the armed forces, if you look at the army, um, they have specialists. If you look at the medical field, they have specialists. If you want to be able to operate efficiently, uh, the best way to do that is to have um, echelons, you know, to have levels of uh, positions. And every person should do their job and their job only. And they're not to second guess someone who is above them. I was watching a medical program the other day uh, about um, emergency uh, room workers, you know, trauma workers. And one of the things that one of the doctors was saying there is, he said, when you go to medical school, he said it literally is like being in the military because you learn that if there is a specialist in a field, if someone has been certified and licensed in a certain area and you call them in on a case, he said whatever their judgment, whatever their 
ultimate call, he said, you're supposed to uh, cooperate and you're supposed to coalesce to that. You don't argue with them. You don't debate with them. Uh, they're the specialists. So therefore, you simply yield to their expertise. And uh, so Satan operates in this way. And this is so important for people to understand. Satan operates in this way. That is why spirits are identified by the work they do. Just like I said the other day, there are people today whose last name is Carpenter because somewhere in their family history, uh, one of their forefathers was a carpenter, and he became known as John the Carpenter, and that evolved over the centuries and became a family name. Uh, John Carpenter then gave uh, birth to uh, the last name Carpenter, you know, or Parsons. Someone in the past was a parson, a minister, a preacher, and therefore the name became Parsons, you know. Um, with demons, it is the same way. It's not about them going by a name. Uh, there are a few names mentioned in scriptures relative to demon spirits, like, for instance, Beelzebub. Beelzebub is Satan's uh, right-hand man. Beelzebub, in terms of angelic uh, authority and power, is prince of devils, or he is over, so he is a general. He is higher than those that are beneath him. However, demons are identified by the work they do. There are spirits that affect various areas in human emotion. That can be everything from jealousy, that can be greed, that can be um, uh, covetousness, that can be lust, that can be anger, that can be uh, depression, uh, it can be um, hopelessness, and uh, when a person of God, a man of God, a person who has been endowed by the Lord with the gift of discernment. When, uh, when I begin to cast demons out of a person, the Lord will literally just begin to allow me to speak out each spirit by their work. You know, I'm not calling out Beelzebub and Zozo and Yippee-yay-yay -yay and yuppie yay you No. That foolishness concerning, oh, if you can figure out their name, that's powerful, you know, and you don't want to say the name of the demon. That's a game they play. That's foolishness. That's games that demons play, okay? It's all part of the deception. The reality is uh, when you call them out, you call them out by name. You call them out by their work that they're doing. Now, I mentioned earlier I was going to bring up uh, something wonderful that transpired this weekend at this conference. The pastor of the conference, Brother Sonny, had told me that Sunday he would like for me to get up and say a few words and greet the people and what have you. And uh, so I knew that Sunday uh, I was going to be given this opportunity well, while Tommy and I were driving up to Kentucky, the Holy Ghost spoke to me in the car and said, there is going to be a woman at this conference, a woman, not just a person, but a woman, who has been vexed and tormented by a spirit of guilt and shame. And this spirit is afflicting her even in ways she may not understand, even in ways she may not recognize. See, a lot of times a spirit, especially a spirit of like guilt or a spirit of shame, what those spirits will do is they will take something in our past and make us feel guilty about it and make us feel uh, 
as though somehow we're it to blame and it's our fault for, for something. And it can be, folks, the enemy doesn't play fair. It can be child abuse. It can be sexual abuse. It can be rape. It can be all kinds of terrible experiences. And the enemy will come against us with this uh, spirit of guilt that causes us to assume blame or to assume guilt for something that has happened in our life. And then what he will do is he will expand that guilt so that in the future we begin to start accepting guilt for many things that happen in our lives. Um, somebody in the church leaves and you may not even know the reason. I know this because I've been through this myself. You may not know why they left. They never gave any explanation. They never uh, offered you any information as to why they're leaving. And the preacher turns around and begins to feel guilty. The enemy makes them believe that it's somehow their fault that this person has left the church. And you see, so once they get that guilt in your life from some experience way back here somewhere, they then will try to expand that guilt and they will cause that guilt to uh, constantly reappear in further experiences that you have so that you become more and more and more under the weight of guilt and shame. And then what oftentimes can happen is that, that spirit of guilt can open itself up to a spirit of depression. That spirit of depression can then open up the door for a suicidal spirit. You see what I'm saying? It's all about echelons, but each spirit does its job uh, and its job only. They focus on one specific thing. When this, when the Lord came upon the man in the tombs, uh, and the the spirits within him declared that uh, their name was Legion, for they were many. That indicates that there were many levels. There were many levels of authority that this man probably started out with one spirit somewhere way down in the bottom of the heap, but he opened the door to it. And then turn around as time went by, another spirit was able to get another spirit and another spirit and another spirit. And I've cast spirits out of people. And I'm telling you, I've had the Spirit of the Lord just open my mind and open my eyes. And uh, I'm able to understand that God allows me to know that this individual, for instance, was raped or this person was molested as a child. And that is where the door was opened. That is how the door opened. The, the enemy took advantage of that um, horrible experience and a spirit of guilt or some, you know, spirit of depression, something like that, uh, was able to come in and take hold and get a stronghold in that person's life. Because at some point, that person, it's all about what you become convinced of, which is why I say spirits are all about deceiving. So if that spirit can convince you that you somehow brought this upon yourself or you somehow are at fault for this, then if you buy that lie, you've just given that spirit permission to uh, attach itself to you. You've given it permission. Like I said, permission is not always on purpose. Oftentimes people do it very much by accident, not at all meaning to have done, but they give that spirit permission. And once you've given one spirit permission, you're, you're allowing uh, that door potentially to be further and further open because then that spirit of guilt does his work and over the course of time, depression starts to set in. And then you turn around and rather than 
rebuking that depression rather than taking authority over that depression, you wind up kind of accepting it because after all, it's the byproduct of your guilt and you bought into the guilt. So now you buy into the depression and then now you buy into the depression and before too long, a suicidal spirit. Do you follow what I'm saying? So this is how demon spirits operate. This weekend, uh, the Lord told me before Tommy and I even got to the conference that there was an individual, a woman, in the that was going to be in the meeting who has been under the influence of a spirit of guilt and shame and that um, she needed deliverance from this. And um, I thought, well, Lord, you know, I don't know exactly how you're going to play it out so that I can minister to this woman, but it, by all means, give me the opportunity. Well, then Brother Sonny told me on, I believe on Thursday or Friday, he said, I want you to sp uh, speak for a few minutes on Sunday, if you would. And I thought, okay, well, praise God. Um, maybe then I'll have the opportunity. When Tommy and I walked into the meeting, the first service on Friday night, I looked around the room and immediately I saw this woman and the Holy Ghost said, that's her. That's the one right there. And uh, so throughout the course of the whole meeting, literally, every time I looked at this woman, I had this knowledge that God had given me concerning her, this discernment that God had given me concerning her. Every time I talked to her, I, I knew this, I had this information, but I was waiting on God's timing to be able to somehow, some way minister to her. Well, as it happens, Tommy and I Tommy and I took a nap on Sunday and once again we kind of overslept. The meeting was to start at six and we woke up at six. And luckily our hotel was about five minutes from the church, but we had to throw ourselves together and get ready and run to the church. And I told Tommy, I said, Oh Lord, I was so upset that we were running late. I said, I cannot afford to miss my opportunity. Brother Sonny said he wanted me. Well, I was afraid if we got there too late that, you know, I, I might not be given that opportunity. And I said, Brother Sonny said, you know, he wanted me to say some words. And I have a feeling that that's when the Lord's going to open the door for me to minister to this woman. And I was upset about running late. And we, we got there, couldn't even stop for food. Uh, and I, you know, I have to eat before every single service because my sugar is so goofy that um, I go in with low sugar and honey, I am, am, am listless, I am energyless, I'll prattle on and on in talking, which I'm afraid I did Sunday as well. You got to take the good with the bad. Long story short, in the course of my speaking uh, up here, I finally was able to go over uh, to the site of the sanctuary this lady was on, and I began to tell her, I said, Sister, the Spirit of the Lord showed me, and by the way, just so that I would have a witness to the fact that God had given me this information before, the, before long before the service, I had told Tommy, I said, there's a lady here, the Lord has shown me, blah, blah, blah. And I told him who she was, so on and so forth. So anyway, so I began to give her a word of knowledge, and I began to tell her that the Lord showed me there's a spirit of guilt and shame that has vexed you, and it has caused you so much uh, travail and so much trouble and so much grief and blah, blah, blah. And uh, this woman, bless her heart, the, she and her partner sat there, and at first they were very stoic, and uh, and I'm I'm uh, folks, I do not think of myself as uh, infallible by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, and I don't claim infallibility. People think when you have a prophetic ministry that every word that that person speaks is going to be accurate. Not necessarily. There are times when we can get ahead of ourselves. There are times when we can get in ourselves and wind up saying something. Um, 
that is not in fact prophetic, that is not in fact thus saith the Lord. And I am concerned every time I have to address somebody with something the Lord has shown me, there's a certain amount of fear in me. Dear Lord, please don't let me be speaking out of turn. Please don't let me be wrong because I'm going to be making a fool out of myself. And anyway, long story short, um, all of a sudden this woman just burst loose and began to weep. And the Holy Ghost hit me, and I went down and laid hands on her, and I rebuked that spirit and took authority over that spirit and cast it forth in the name of Jesus. And uh, later in the service, this same lady got up and began to share that she had served in the military, and that while she was in the military, uh, she was doing her job at one point and working with a man, and she realized that this extent, this cord that uh, for an electric item they were using was very badly frayed, and therefore she wouldn't plug it in. And uh, she said something to this man she was working with about it, but he didn't listen, and he decided he was going to plug it in anyhow, and he plugged it in, and she turned around, and he had fried himself, killed himself. Uh, the electricity went through his body and killed him, and for years, she said, she's been plagued to the point that she couldn't sleep, that she had nightmares, you know, all kinds of vexation relative to this, and she has felt guilty. She's felt like, well, maybe there was something more I could have done. Maybe there was something I should have done differently, so on and so forth. And this enemy had vexed her with this. So I was, in fact, right. And this was something she... And then there was another lady in the congregation that the Holy Ghost spoke to me concerning said that she had been vexed for many, many years with a spirit of confusion. And the spirit of confusion would not allow her to settle her mind on virtually anything, any issue. Uh, she was just constantly in a state of upheaval because she couldn't, uh, make up her mind and, and have a conviction and be convinced of anything. And so she was struggling with this, and the Holy Ghost showed me this. And I called her out, and I asked her to come down to the front of the sanctuary. And I told her, I gave her a word of knowledge, the Spirit of, of the Lord has revealed to me that you've wrestled with a spirit of confusion, and this is what it's done, and da 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 and I laid hands on this lady, and she began to weep and just pray in the Spirit. And the Holy Ghost flowed through her. And afterwards, when we went out to eat after the service, she said to me, I have not been able, she said, I've had the Holy Ghost for decades. I have not been able to pray in the Spirit for 20 years. She said, I literally have not been able to yield to the Holy Ghost and pray in the Spirit in 20 years. She said, tonight when you called me down there and you gave me that word and you laid your hands on me, she said, man, I'm telling you, oh, I couldn't stop it. She said, it just flowed. She said, the Holy Ghost just flowed through me. She said, and here I was praying in the Holy Ghost for the first time in 20 years. Oh, folks, I want to tell you, this thing is real. And these spirits, you know, uh, sometimes they can sound so small and insignificant. And yet in reality, the influence they can have on our life can be massive. It, it can be powerful. When I first moved to uh, the city of Dallas, every community, every city, every principality has what we refer to as a prevailing spirit. There is a spirit that literally will affect an entire community, an entire city, an entire county, an entire state. And literally, again, it's just like government. You have different levels. And so 
when I go to a new city, one of the first things I do is ask the Lord, Lord, what is the prevailing spirit in this city? And when I went to Dallas, the Lord told me this, this prevailing spirit, and I had never in a million years even thought of a spirit having this kind of work. But the spirit the Lord showed me that prevails in Dallas, Texas, is a pretentious spirit. He said there is a spirit of pretense in this community. As I lived there, my God, I saw how that spirit worked. I saw how that spirit affected people. You've never seen a, and some people are going to get mad at me, that's okay. You have never seen a more pretentious, full of a lonely city in your life as Dallas, Texas. People there are so stinking pretentious, it isn't even funny. And when I first went there, I would sometimes go with Tommy and we would go to a, one of the LGBT establishments because I love to play pool. We don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't carouse, we don't party, we don't do drugs, but I like to play pool. And we wanted to be in an environment where we could feel comfortable and be ourselves, so we would go to an LGBT uh, establishment. And I'd be there playing pool. Now, when I used to go play pool, or I played in the pool league in New York City while living in New York City, I could talk to people around the pool table, you know, and we would just strike up a conversation and we'd have a nice talk. I wound up making, I don't know how many friends, literally people that wound up coming to my house and uh uh, uh, couples that I made friends with, individuals I made friends with, had nothing to do with romance, had nothing to do with intimacy. It was just strictly friendship. But I can't even name how many friends I made while I was playing pool in New York City. So here I am in Dallas, and I'll be talking to somebody in Dallas, and they would ask me, like, uh, what kind of work do you do? Or where do you live? You know, and I didn't think anything of it. So I'd tell them the neighborhood I lived in, or I'd tell them uh, what kind of work I did. And folks, I kid you not, this happened to me so many times, I can't even count it. I would tell people certain things, and if you didn't tell them the right neighborhood, if you didn't live in Lakewood, or if you didn't live in Highland Park, or if you didn't at least live in uh, uh, the, the Gaberhood, you know, uh, the, I had people literally just, oh yeah, and turn away as if we were never talking and walk away. Or if you're not wearing clothes that are designer label, they wouldn't even talk to you. Uh, if, if you got out of a car and they saw you getting out of a car, and if it wasn't a car that impressed them, then they wouldn't even talk to you. Um, I knew our church in Dallas struggled and struggled and struggled because we could not afford to have a location in one of the so-called better neighborhoods in Dallas. When we were in, for instance, when we shared for almost two years, we shared a, an Episcopal church in an area uh, called Lakewood. And while we were there, we did pretty well. When we had services in the Gaberhood in Oak Lawn, we did very well. We'd get real good turnout. We'd get real good. People would come by the dozens. We'd have people come into church and for, for long periods of time. But when we moved even the slightest bit outside of certain neighborhoods, all of a sudden we couldn't get people to come to church for all the money in the world. Because that spirit of pretentiousness makes it so that everybody's trying to outshine everybody else. You know the old saying, 
keeping up with the Joneses. Well, that spirit of pretension, it, it causes everybody to be in competition with everybody, excuse me, everybody else. And it's all about wearing the right clothes. It's all about looking the right way. It's all about living in the right neighborhoods. And some people would just about break their back to try to um, live in a certain neighborhood when they couldn't afford to live there. So here they are spending half their income on an apartment. They can't even afford furniture to furnish it. But that's how important it was to them to be able to impress people with an address in a certain neighborhood, you know. And uh, so anyway, so... Uh, you don't realize, I never thought for, in a million years, it never dawned on me how destructive and how uh, a spirit of pretense could literally get in the way of people finding the Lord. Because again, if our church wasn't in just the right neighborhood, if it didn't look just a certain way, people weren't going to go there. There was one church in the city that had been there for many years, and it was in the neighborhood, and, and they were able to, over the years, especially during the HIV uh, epidemic, you know, during the uh, AIDS, horrible years of AIDS in the 80s and 90s, uh, that church grew to a huge number. People were dying, and they were going back to church and trying to make themselves right with God. And this particular church wound up with all kind of money and all kinds of people, and they were able to build this big, fancy, pretty edifice. And, you know, and oh, boy, I'll tell you what, people in Dallas, they... Then nobody thought anything of going to this one particular church because, after all, if you say you go to this church, it's prestigious. If you say you go to this church, it's shiny, it's pretty, it's in the right neighborhood. And that is literally how minds in that city work. Didn't matter. If the message was right or wrong, that didn't matter in the least. What mattered is the appearances, the appearance. That's what a spirit of pretense is all about. It's all about appearance. It's about facade. It's about shine. Well, unfortunately, the Lord told me when I was a kid that I'd have a ministry like that of John the Baptist. And in many ways, I certainly do. John the Baptist um, was probably the least pretentious man on the planet. The Bible said he wore camel's hair and he ate uh, locusts and wild honey. This man didn't care about having uh, what kind of diet he had. He didn't care about impressing people with his attire, with his clothing. He preached out in the wilderness. He didn't preach in the middle of the city streets. He preached out in the wilderness. He wasn't worried about trying to accommodate people and make it more comfortable for them, make it easier on them. And I got news for you. This preacher has that spirit. Um, I wear what I wear. I buy stuff at thrift shops. You know, half the suits, um, way more than half the suits in my closet I probably bought at a thrift shop. I'm not interested in 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 uh, impressing people with my attire. I'm not interested in impressing people with the kind of car I drive or what address I live at. And that's one of the reasons why. Uh, the 20 plus years I was in Dallas, we had such a difficult time. And uh, the prevailing spirit there was pretense. Got news for you. I came here to um, uh, Huntsville and I asked the Lord when we got here. I told Tommy, I said, I'm praying and asking the Lord what the prevailing spirit is in this town. And I I was not getting an answer. I, I wasn't discerning it, and I was having an awful hard time. And uh, finally, um, not too long ago, as things begin to happen, 
And uh, we began to experience a bunch of this negativity and this vitriol. And I had accusations being thrown at me. And I had people trying to suggest that, you know, I was a fake and a fraud. He doesn't have a ministry. He doesn't have, you know, he's full of baloney. Blah, 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 blah. And I mean, the, the accusations that were coming, folks, were coming hard and fast. And I said, Lord, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I've been doing affirming ministry for over 31 years. I have never seen a community respond to my ministry in such a horrible, negative, vitriolic, accusatory, nasty way. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, The prevailing spirit in this city is a spirit of anger. People in this community will get angry over anything and everything. They get worked up over the smallest things. The enemy uses that spirit of anger to stir up angst and negativity so that uh, they constantly are in opposition to the church. They constantly are in opposition to the gospel because they're angry at the church. They're angry at preachers. They're angry at God. And he showed me this, and I realized, I said, Dear Lord, that is what we're facing in this community, a spirit of anger. And so, again, I repeat, uh, spirits operate specifically in one area. If you ever see in your emotional life that it appears something is going out of whack or something is going haywire and you constantly find yourself angry and you constantly find yourself, I'm not talking about the Bible said be angry but sin not. Uh, anger is, is, is a natural human emotion. There's nothing wrong with being angry from time to time. But if you notice that for some reason, for instance, again, I'm going to refer to some of these programs on television uh, that so-called ghosts and hauntings. How many times have you seen people say, that uh, when they moved into this home and they begin to experience things. So all of a sudden I was feeling uh, depressed all the time. I was feeling uh, moody. I was very angry. I just watched a story recently where a man, a famous man, uh, a member of the Kiss uh, band uh, from back in the day, uh, I think it was Ace Freely, and he was saying that in this home he had bought that he and his wife, he said, all of a sudden, he said, we were constantly angry. We were constantly yelling at each other. We were constantly at odds with one another. And he said, ultimately, it led to divorce. He said, my wife and I divorced. And then he ultimately moved away from that property. And guess what happened? He found a new woman. He married a new woman. Everything went beautifully. He said, I told her, why don't we move back? He said, he had a feeling that that house had something to do with what was going on, you know, in his first marriage. But he said, well, maybe that, maybe I was wrong. You know, maybe that isn't correct. And he and his second wife moved back to the house. And the same thing happened all over again. Apparently, somebody who had occupied that home prior to him had this spirit of anger. And when that person died, that spirit now is disembodied. That spirit no longer has a host. And the Word of God said that when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he roameth through the dry places. So he's roaming around looking for his next victim. Oftentimes, those spirits will linger in the vicinity of uh, where they occupied, where they were for a period of time within a host. So therefore, it appears as though they become associated with that house. And on top of that, if that person died, uh, not even necessarily in that house, but if that person died, then that spirit turns around and says, well, the easiest way for me to deceive people and fool people is to make them think that I am that person. It's not that person. 
It is the spirit that occupied that person who is now camouflaging themselves, representing themselves as that person. And yet, at the same time, the work that they do is becoming manifest. You begin to see that vexation. You begin to see that oppression uh, manifest itself. And again, I'll say, um, this happens especially when a person commits suicide after they have been under the influence of a suicidal spirit. When they commit suicide, within a very short time, very short time, the next weakest link in the family or in the home is going to wind up being vexed by a suicidal spirit. You can count on it. It is going to happen just as sure as I'm alive. And you need to look out for that. So, next thing you know, that person's child or that person's spouse, whoever uh, is remaining, uh, becomes vexed by a suicidal spirit, you know. And uh, it is statistically a fact that oftentimes when one person commits suicide, that you then see a chain of suicides. You will see additional suicides within the family. This is something that occurs. This is something that happens on a regular basis that has been quantified and qualified and proven scientifically. This isn't, uh, you know, they're looking at it from a scientific perspective, but oftentimes it can be understood from a spiritual perspective, okay? So again, let's go back to our list, what we know about hauntings and ghosts. Um, a, a parent is the only spiritual covering or protection that a child has until they're, they're able to establish a walk with God for themselves. And again, this is why if a parent is not established spiritually, if they are not well established in the truth of God's word, then their child can become vexed. Their child can become oppressed. And yes, in fact, their child can even become possessed um, because the only covering a child has is their mom or dad until they're at a place in their life where they can establish their own relationship with God. We understand from a biblical perspective that um, a human spirit will wind up in only one of two locations after death. There is no mention made in Scripture of lingering. There is no mention made in Scripture of ones being stuck here on the earthly plane and all this. No, the Word of God said that upon death the spirit of man returns to God, and it is therefore God's possession, and he will place it in one of two locations. We understand from a spirit, uh, biblical perspective that a ghost cannot be the spirit of a human being, as human spirits are relegated to God's control. They're not under their own control. They can't make their own decision. They can't decide to stay. They can't get confused and get stuck. No, after death, God is in control of that spirit. Um, a ghost or a spirit appearing in solid flesh and blood form would suggest that the dead have the power to resurrect themselves at will. They do not. Only God can raise the dead. Again, I saw a story just, I think it was last night or this morning somewhere, uh, of a young man had a visitation, he claims, from his dead father after his father had died, and his father was flesh and blood. He was literally able to embrace his son and hold his son and give him a hug. Oh, that sounds sweet. That sounds wonderful. Folks, let me tell you something. The devil will feed you a uh, deceit. 
he will deceive you with ice cream just as quick as he'll deceive you with liver, okay? Just because the story sounds sweet, just because the scenario seems touching and seems emotional, that does not make it any more legitimate. No, the enemy, it, his whole work is deception. That's all he does. That's all these spirits do. So whatever it takes to convince you that what the Word of God teaches is inaccurate and cannot be relied upon and cannot be trusted, that is what he's going to do. And let me fill you in on a little secret today. The people who walk, the ministers, the preachers, the Christians who walk in the power of God and in the power of the Holy Ghost, let me tell you who they are. They are those who are the most committed to the Word of God. If you, uh, I, you know, I grew up with a wonderful man of God who was associated with our family, Brother Warren Tatlock from Wolcott, Connecticut. Brother Tatlock was a Jesus name, independent Jesus name, one God preacher. And Brother Tatlock, let me tell you, that man walked in the power of God. He walked I mean, God healed people and touched people, and so many wonderful things happened under that man's ministry. But those who walk in the power of God, if you want to walk in the power of God, then you have to have absolute conviction in every word that God speaks because when we come against the enemy, the Word of God says the only offensive weapon that we have. Scripture said, put on the whole armor of God. Well, the armor of God is designed to protect us from the attacks of the enemy. The only offensive offensive weapon that we have is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So when you come against a demon, when I go into a home that somebody claims is haunted or they're experiencing uh, spiritual activity in that home, I go through that home and I am quoting the Word of God. I'm declaring the Word of God. The dead have no inheritance. Upon death, the spirit of man returns to God. And I begin to quote scripture, and I begin to quote scripture, and I'm letting that spirit know, you don't fool me, because I know what the Word of God says, and I believe what the Word of God says. And when you do this, it literally just strips that camouflage off of that spirit. It literally just strips that false identity that they're wearing. And oftentimes uh, when a spirit is identifying itself as a person that died or lived at that property, whatever, um, uh, I will even command that spirit and I'll tell that spirit, uh, reveal your true nature. Reveal your true identity. And then the Spirit of the Lord will help me, and I will identify the uh, Spirit by its work. I say, aha, we're dealing with the Spirit of murder. This isn't Jane Doe. This is the Spirit of murder. This isn't so-and-so. This is a Spirit of depression. This isn't so-and-so. This is the Spirit of suicide. Okay? So they'll try. I told you when I went through one man's house, a friend of mine, and performed an expulsion as the spirits were leaving. Literally, I was able to discern how they represented themselves, what they represented themselves as. Two represented themselves as men. One represented itself as a woman. One of them was the strong man or the higher in authority, the higher in power. I never did ask or, or I never needed to ask the Lord, 
what the work of that spirit, what the work of those spirits was, because I was able to eject them without even needing to know that. But I did know by the Holy Ghost how many, how they represented themselves, and that information I was able to use with the man who uh, lived there to verify that everything they had done, that that is exactly what they had been dealing with through a Ouija board. Two, two so-called people that identified as men, one that identified as a woman, so on and so forth, okay? All right. Um, but we know that a human spirit has no ability to resurrect itself, even for a moment, even for for a split second. So for something to appear as a literal flesh and blood um, being, uh, something tangible, something you can touch and feel, uh, that cannot possibly be a human spirit. Human spirits do not possess the necessary biological elements to produce sounds, smells, or to affect the natural world in any way as to create um, sounds or to move objects. That all requires that somehow they be able to manifest in the physical world, and human spirits do not have that power. Demons, however, and angels for that matter, can. All of the attributes ascribed to ghosts are ascribed in Scripture to the spirit realm that includes both angels and demons. God does not use or permit fear. Angels will immediately speak peace to a situation. Do not be afraid or fear not is generally the first words an angel will speak. Demons will not. Demons love when you're terrified. So a lot of times, even when uh, a demon manifests itself as somebody you know or somebody you love, how many times have you seen stories where people say, you know, it was my grandmother, it was my grandfather, but at first, you know, I was terrified, I was scared to death. And yet, grandma or grandpa never said, oh, don't be afraid, honey, it's just me. No. Never happens. Now, that spirit's more than happy for that fear to be there for however long that fear wants to be there. They're not interested. They, they're never, ever going to try to chase away fear. Fear is one of the most powerful uh, tools that Satan has in his arsenal. And folks, I'm going to tell you a little secret. A spirit of fear is one of the most powerful demons you'll ever come up against. They're up there in the echelons. They're up there in authority and power, a spirit of fear. So therefore, if you're seeing so-called a ghost and all of a sudden you're terrified, uh, even though it turns out to be grandma or it turns out to be Uncle Joe or it turns out to be Sally Mae that you used to play with as a kid, even during that brief moment of fear, there's the possibility that that person opens themselves up to a spirit of fear. And then all of a sudden, they find themselves constantly looking over their shoulder. They're constantly afraid something is going to appear. They're constantly afraid grandma's going to show up and shock them and surprise them when they're not expecting her to show up. And that spirit of fear begins to take root in their life. Uh, demons can and will physically harm people. They cannot kill. If you look at the story of Job, they, the devil was never given permission to take Job's life, but he was given permission to physically vex Job, and uh, the enemy brought disease and sores upon him that caused him great pain and struggle. Uh, the demons can cause harm. They can cause injury. They can even... Uh, um, spirits of infirmity can literally cause um, the symptoms of disease and illness. 
uh, they can cause you to become sick. They can cause you to begin to manifest all kinds of uh, symptoms of illness and disease and sickness, but they cannot take your life. What a spirit will, a demon spirit will always try to do is they will try to use the powers they have to push you to take your own life. So if, for instance, if that, uh, if the enemy could have convinced Job that he was so miserable and so vexed by God and God had abandoned him, so on and so forth, Job might have decided to take his own life. That would have been the outcome that the enemy desired because that would have shown that Job's faith and confidence in God did not remain even through all the uh, oppression and all the sickness and disease that had come into his life. Uh, it, demons try to drive a person to self-harm and self-destruction. That can include self-injury. That can include things like um, uh, these folks who will starve themselves because every time they look in the mirror, they see a fat person. You know, that condition, um, anorexia. Um, you know, folks, I believe with all my heart that in many instances that anorexia is caused by a demonic power. I believe that with every ounce of my being. And uh, a lot of times if a person is anorexic and if, if they would go into a place where someone with discernment of spirits, someone that knew how to operate in the power of God was present, I believe they could be delivered from that oppression and that vexation. And I'm not sure in many instances it isn't even a possession by that spirit because spirits will motivate people to self-harm. So if people begin to cut themselves, if people begin um, to physically harm themselves, or even they'll drive you to um, self-abuse. This is where in the New Testament the term is used, abusers of themselves with mankind. There are some who try to interpret that as homosexuals and gay lesbian people. That's not what it's talking about. But demon spirits will cause you to behave in ways that are self-destructive. People are driven to party. They go out every night and they work a job, but they still go to the club every night. They do drugs. They drink to excess. They do all kinds of things. They're abusing themselves. That term abusers of themselves with mankind literally means, in essence, a partier. Somebody who uh, lives a party life to excess. And um, it is self-destructive. They become exhausted. They become tired. They lose their jobs. They can't hold a job because they're always tired. But at the same time, they're constantly being driven. They feel like they have to go out and they, they have to be in the club. They have to be in the bar. They have to be on the street cruising. They have to be doing any number of activities which are self-destructive. Um, trying to go through this real quick because... Uh, I basically have covered what we covered last week plus a point or two. Demons will do and say things which are meant to draw people away from God and to create a conflict in one's believing the Word of God. Um, I, I was watching a program just recently with this Kim Russo who's supposed to be this world-class, you know, psychic and, uh, and medium and all this foolishness. And she was um, going through a home with Billy Ray Cyrus, a very famous country-western singer, who grew up with a father that sang gospel music and what have you. And yet, Billy Ray Cyrus, who's about as country as they come, is just eating up every word this woman says. And this woman is telling him, oh, 
You used to be this person in your previous life. And now the spirit that is coming, uh, that is manifesting itself now in your home, he's doing so because he believes you're his brother, because you were his brother in your past life. And here's Billy Ray Cyrus. Really? Well, oh, hi, what do you know about that? I'll be in front of the gun. And he's just buying every word she said, buying into every word she he says. So now he's buying into reincarnation. He's not believing what the word of God says concerning it is appointed unto man once, once, once to die and then the judgment. So the spirits are using her in this instance to promote a doctrine to promote an ideology that is false and completely contradictory to scripture. And how many Christians, this is why I really don't recommend that most of you watch these programs on television and stuff, because if you do not know the Word of God well enough, if you do not have the, the level of conviction in the Word of God that you need to have, you might easily wind up falling after some of these false ideologies and false teachings. Spirits which, which may have once occupied an individual become disembodied after the death of that individual. Therefore, many of the so-called ghosts people claim to encounter are not the person who has died, but the spirit which once occupied the individual who has died. And as I've said, spirits are identified by the work they do. For instance, um, a spirit of lust, spirit of greed, a spirit of murder, a spirit of anger, a spirit of jealousy, a spirit of bitterness, angst, depression, suicide. I've seen stories, for instance, where uh, people move into a home and they, the husband and wife have had a great relationship. They've had a wonderful marriage. They're very much happy with one another. And then all of a sudden, the husband begins to manifest a constant uh, jealousy that he never manifested before. All of a sudden, he's constantly jealous, and they're arguing, and they're fighting. because. And then next thing you know, they're divorced. And it's all because of this spirit of jealousy, which had occupied an individual, but became disembodied. They lost their host. Now they look for the next victim. Now they look for the weakest link in the chain. And it can be the man, it can be the woman, you know, it can be a child. But they're going to look for the weakest link. And, uh, oh, I'm telling you folks, spirits have ended many a marriage. Trust me, it's also spirits have destroyed families. They've destroyed relationships between parents and children. Uh, this is what demons do. And part of their deceptive work, part of what assists them, is if they can separate you from the rest. So they try to isolate people. They try to drive people away from from the individual who is being vexed or the individual who's being oppressed. And they will try to make it so that nobody wants to be around them and no one wants to interact with them so that they can isolate them and get them alone. Because once they've done that, then again, the road to self-destruction becomes a whole lot easier, okay? I'm going to try to finish this list real quick. And then next week, we're going to expand these principles and we're going to look at how they apply to other forms of, um, of uh, paranormal activity. Um, So-called ghosts we often see become very upset or angry when a spiritual individual is brought in to try and resolve the issue at hand. The only spirit as children of God, that we are ever, ever to seek after or to desire to communicate with is that of God. My Catholic friend, you put yourself in a very 
dangerous position by praying to saints and praying to angels. You put yourself in a very spiritually precarious and dangerous place. The Word of God teaches us that the only spirit we ought ever communicate with or fellowship with or commune with is the Spirit of God, period. We don't pray to Michael the Archangel. We don't pray to Mother Mary. We don't pray to St. John the Divine. We pray to God and God alone. Didn't the Lord say in the Old Testament word, did he not say concerning those who go and seek the advice of uh, and the counsel of witches and um, diviners and uh, fortune tellers and mediums, so on and so forth. Did he not say, isn't that what I'm for? Should you not be coming to your God as children of God? The, the Lord himself is our help at all times. He is our source for everything everything. We don't need anyone else. No one else is necessary. God is more than sufficient in every circumstance. And to think otherwise, my friend, is to be on dangerous territory. You think you need the help of saints. You think you need the help of angels, and you try to communicate with those uh, you're you're walking on thin ice. Um, again, you <laughs> many people, well-meaning as they may be, wind up inviting all kinds of spiritual influences into their life by praying to the dead and uh, and trying to ask the dead to do things for them. And then, how many times? I'm from Connecticut. I'm from New England. Up in New England, Catholic people will pray to St. Jude. And if St. Jude does uh, what they ask him to do according to their uh, belief system, they're supposed to publish this novena in the newspaper to give glory and honor to St. Jude. Honey, God has said, I will share my glory with no other. And therefore, you are committing idolatry. You are committing idolatry. And, and trying to explain it away, saying, well, I'm just asking St. Jude to intervene for me by going to God. You don't need St. Jude to intervene for you by going to God. You can go to God. The Word of God said, therefore, now we come boldly, boldly, boldly unto the throne of grace. You don't have to be ashamed. As a child of God, you don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be um, uh, slow to come before the Lord and bring your needs and bring the desires of your heart before him. He has told us this. If you think you've got to go through a mediator, and the word of God said there's one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ the righteous, you don't need anyone but God. And uh, so this, this is one of the most important principles that you need to walk away from this study with. I'm almost done real quick. Um, demons love to create the notion that one, God is absent altogether. You know, this whole idea of people being stuck after they die or people choosing to stay. Well, that suggests that God's nowhere to be found because obviously if God were around, then what he says in his word would be true. But he must not be what we think he is and where we think he is and who we think he is because after all, this person's able to do something that the word of God says they cannot do. So they love to create the notion that God is altogether absent or that he is impotent. 
He doesn't have power in this particular situation. He doesn't have the ability in this particular. The demon is too strong. And, and oh, the priest couldn't overcome this demon. So this demon was too strong. No, wrong. The problem was the priest was too weak. Had nothing to do with God not being powerful enough. You went to the wrong person for your help. Uh, they love to create the notion that the truths of God's word are not true. They want to make you doubt what God has said in his word. Folks, got news for you today. Demons will not respond to religious acts or objects. In other words, saying your rosary is not going to chase a demon away. Post putting up crucifixes in your home. Again, I, I can point to how many stories we've heard of people who put up crucifixes. You know, next thing you know, they find the crucifix hanging upside down and they find the crucifix pulled off the wall. The demon's not doing that because that object scares them. They are doing that to mock that object. They're trying to show you, honey, your crucifix don't mean squat to me. If looking at it doesn't scare me, then touching it and pulling it off the wall certainly doesn't bother me. You follow what I'm saying? Or turning it upside down or causing a Bible uh, to be set on fire, which has actually happened at times. Uh, you know, uh, they're not religious objects, Bibles, and uh, that is not what affects demon spirits. Demon spirits are overcome by faith in the Word of God. And the only offensive, I repeat again, the only offensive weapon we have against the wiles of the enemy is the Word of God. So if you don't believe what you're saying, but you're trying to quote Scripture, that demon sees right through you because you're speaking the Word of God, but you're not speaking it in faith. If you have faith, in the Word of God, then when you speak it, you will speak it with authority. You understand that not only has God given you His Word, but He has, in effect, put His Word in your mouth. Therefore, when you speak it, if you speak it in faith, let me tell you, you know what the enemy hears? He hears Jesus speaking. He hears the Lord God Almighty speaking. And that is why he has to respond. That is why he has to give in. That is why he has to run. The, um, the on demons only respond, as I've just said, to an individual who is acting in true faith. That's why I said, just because you bring some religious figure in, you don't know that they genuinely have faith. Just because somebody's religious doesn't mean they have faith. And bringing somebody religious in and, oh, it didn't work. So that means that uh, this spirit is more powerful than God in this instance. No, that's a lie. The problem is you brought somebody in who may be steeped in religion, but they're absolutely devoid of true faith. And believe me, there are more people in our world who are religious than there are people who have genuine faith, okay? The only power we have is through the authority of the Holy Ghost in the power of Jesus' name as we wield the Word of God. Amen. All right, that is uh, the completion of this week. Next week, we're going to look at expanding all these principles, all these things we've learned from the Word of God concerning ghosts and, and goblins and spirits. And we're going to start to look at other paranormal manifestations, whether that be Bigfoot, whether that be, I mean, Bigfoot, you know, a lot of people say that's just a cryptic, you know, uh, a breed or a species that simply hasn't been uh, quantified yet and and, and um, 
cataloged yet or discovered yet. Um, but there's a good possibility that they are in fact a spiritual manifestation and we'll, we'll look at all that next week, okay? I hope that this study is proving to be a blessing and a help to you. I hope the information we're offering is helping you to find the power and the authority you have as a child of God through the Word of God in the power of Jesus' name, through the authority of the Holy Ghost. The, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, is going to uh, empower you to use the Word of God as a weapon, not against people, but against the enemy. The Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. That's why when, when a man of God, a preacher, a woman of God is full of the Holy Ghost, man, they use the Word of God with authority, man. They come against demons with the Word of God and with the name of Jesus, and they don't do so timidly. They do so boldly with authority because that authority comes through the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost comes through our conviction, our belief in, our obedience to the gospel, and our conviction in the Word of God. Amen. All right, let's close this session tonight. Ran a little bit late, but I wanted to at least finish up this portion uh, without having to go next week to do it. Master, we love you, God. Once again, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to explore the Word of God. What a wonderful truth it is that your people are empowered by the Holy Ghost to yield, to wield the Word of God. And Lord, to use it against the enemy, even as you used the word of God against Satan in the wilderness. Lord, every temptation, every word he spoke, you responded. It is written. Hallelujah. And Master, we thank you for giving us your name, understanding, Lord, that when we know who you are in truth, we become empowered against the enemy, and no weapon formed against us can prosper. Master, you've given us power and authority over every devil, every unclean thing, everything that would exalt itself against the higher knowledge of a living God. You declared, Lord, that we would tread upon serpents and we would tread upon scorpions and nothing would by any means harm us. Master, today in the name of Jesus, let that which we've discussed today come alive in the spirit of every believing hearer Help us, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost and power in the name of Jesus, baptized with your power, Lord, that people might be able to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost and they might be able to speak the Word of God with divine boldness and inspiration and authority. Master, we love you. We thank you for this time together. Go with us from this place as always, O oh God. Keep us in your care, for we ask it in none other than Jesus, Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, uh, again, we are still having services at the moment in Huntsville that will be changing. Um, I invite you to worship with us if you'd like. Century Office Center, 3322 Memorial Parkway Southwest, Suite Number 537. Uh, that is Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. 
Uh, we meet Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. All of our services are recorded and broadcast live on both Facebook and YouTube. So folks online can always join us. If you don't live locally, you can always join us online at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. I hope you'll come back as well and be with us next Wednesday. Uh, as we explore the word of the Lord and we continue this study on ghosts, ghouls, and bumps in the night. Till we meet again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.